Hi, this is Janos, it's Real World Audio, and we are going to talk about double blind tests and blind testing. And uh, there's a lot of us who are very interested in, uh, in scientific methodologies and, and using uh, objective approaches to approach sound quality and, and the perception of sound in audio. And, uh, and let's just get a little bit into the deep on uh, how those tests can truly help you to enjoy audio better, to make better choices in building your system, or become more aware what's going on and, and how you hear things. And uh, as a background, I am sharing with you that uh, in my daytimes, my, my, my real life job is uh, being a research scientist and I work with cancer clinical research trials. So basically, I am doing uh, uh, therapy drug testing in, with cancer drugs and cancer treatments. And at, at the time, uh, at our institutions, we have between uh, 50 to 100 trials going on in parallel. Uh, and we have hundreds and hundreds of patients uh, at any given time. And basically all of them are on clinical trials. Some of them are double blinded, some of them are blinded, and others are at various steps of uh, visibility to both patients and the staff who is uh, following up on how the therapy is progressing, whether it's making a difference for the better or it doesn't do anything or maybe it harms the patient uh, and as such these therapies these blind tests require a very very high level of uh, planning of uh, execution of following up and data analysis and uh, and uh, basically Mankind has been doing these uh, clinical trials for almost a century. And when you go to the pharmacy to pick up any, any medication that your doctor has pres prescribed, all, all of them have gone through clinical trials, clinical testing. Many of that were double blind, many were blind, and some were open label. But one thing in common, is that all of them have gone through testing. And as a result, now where science is, where medical science is, we have an incredible in-depth knowledge about the nature of blind tests, double blind tests, how to apply them, how to plan them, and how to execute them. And that's, that's a level of application and planning that just goes vastly beyond what, uh, what people in general think of what, what the nature of a double blind test is and how you can apply it to audio. So based on my clinical experience uh, and, and, and my in-depth knowledge of how a real double blind test works, uh, I'm going to share um, my thoughts how we can approach double blind tests in audio, audio gear to make our lives better. And uh, for those of us who are more inclined to be interested, scientifically by, uh, minded, amateur scientists who are uh, thinking about double blind tests, for you, some ideas that how these can work for you and what is really the worth of them, how you can use them in your real life to make sense out of it instead of staying at an amateur level and, uh, and just using it as a buzzword to justify a crusade because in, in that sense, uh, it's completely meaningless. And, and, and uh, with my background of working with a true <laughs> well executed and planned double blind test when i look into how the double blind testing uh, were, are done in audio when i read about them they they are really not not well planned uh, very poorly executed and the data analysis is uh, 
next to uh, none. So, so, so usually when, when such a thing uh, comes up as double blind testing in audio, um, I would not put any weight to those, uh, to the majority of those tests, or actually you would have to really analyze the test, look what happened, what they were testing, what were the circumstances, who were the judges, how were their responses graded, and then you can infer certain limited conclusions when you know the methodology and the grading of the study and how the analysis went. And uh, what we are seeing is the exact opposite, is that uh, there was a test done with certain limitations, certain conditions, and they are making generalizations out of it and making those blanket statements that really uh, give us false ideas and these uh, preposterous preconceptions that people have on audio. And they think that those preconceptions are scientific based on hard data, why they are not. They were based on limiting, uh, ex limited experiences uh, 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 extrapolated to uh, that kind of data set, that kind of circumstances where they cannot be extrapolated to. So uh, now this sounded a little bit cryptic. So what, what, what on earth is going on? So let's just uh, talk first where a double blind test is useful and, uh, and how can it be uh, of help to you. And the medical field is, is a perfect area to show the efficacy of double blind tests, why they work better and why there is a need for that. And, and the need for blinding a test is to remove bias. What is bias? Bias is when you are, you have a subjective opinion, a subjective perception on a subject. So basically, when you have a blind test, then the patient who is receiving the medication or treatment, they don't know whether uh, they are receiving the active ingredient or they receive something that does not affect their condition which is otherwise known as a placebo. This can happen with treatments as well. So for example, uh, you can test the effects of acupuncture on uh, dryness of mouth. And then you can set up treatment that uh, where the placebo <laughs> equivalent is basically acupuncture, but uh, using uh, acupuncture points that do not affect the dryness of the mouth do not if, if affect saliva secretion. And the active arm of the treatment is uh, hitting those uh, acupuncture points which affect your, uh, your saliva uh, secretion. So basically there's uh, all kinds of uh, uh, phenomena that you could observe. But when we are on the clinical side and testing medications and treatments, there is always a measurable outcome. So basically, we follow the patient and we see that the condition we are trying to treat, what sort of change are we observing for the changes? So, and, and we set a threshold and if the, the change in the condition is above the threshold, then the therapy works. If it's below the threshold, then it did not work. And then we compare all of the participants that do, did they meet the threshold or not. Uh, so that's one thing that we can measure how well a therapy has worked, how well something has performed. So we can grade the uh, outcome of the individual results. So when we are blinding a patient, then the patient doesn't know which one he or she is getting. So uh, the psychology of the patient will not affect the outcome of the result. Why is that? Because when you know that you are getting a pill that is supposed to work, 
then you motivate your willpower and uh, uh, when you motivate your willpower it affects your subconscious mind and the subconscious mind is in control of the immune system. This is a known scientific fact that when you are in a positive mood, you believe that you will uh, be healed, then your immune system is, uh, is uh, working at its optimal performance and is helping you to heal. Versus the other condition, if you know that you have received the sham, basically you are not receiving anything to help you get better. So it means that you are all alone, you are not receiving any help to change your condition. And then people get desperate, they get stressful. And when you are stressful, you are negative, that blocks the efficiency of the immune system. So basically your healing is hindered and so if you already know what you are getting then we are already biasing you to succeed or to fail if you know which one you are getting and we don't want to test how well you are in control of your own immune system we want to remove that from uh, the equation and, and we want to remove that because when the drug will be available after a successful test, then everyone will know that you are getting the drug. So, so that's one reason why this is happening. And uh, however, even though the patient uh, doesn't know what he's getting, the person giving the treatment still knows it if it's just a blind test. And then the patient is always trying to find out what am I getting the placebo or, or the agent and based on the reactions of the physicians might get clues about it. That, oh, I must be receiving the placebo because the doctor looks really gloomy about it. And when I ask about him, he's like being very negative. So, and, and also if the doctor knows that you are getting the placebo, then he is analyzing the results, the outcome results, he is more prone to say that if you are close to the threshold and, and it's questionable on how to attribute the outcome, whether it was successful or not successful, it's just on the borderline. So if you receive the uh, treatment medication, then the physician has the tendency to attribute success to it because as a doctor, you want uh, the trial to succeed. If, because uh, as, as a doctor or nurse, when you are seeing the patients every day, they are taking the medication and, and, and you see that some of them improve, their condition improve, then you want that test subjectively to succeed, to give that chance to other people out there. And you are willing to help the test pass. But uh, you might be doing something wrong because you might be unintentionally changing, biasing the outcome of the test and, uh, and, and, and it will end in releasing a, a, a treatment, a cure, a drug to the population that has issues that should not be released. So basically because you don't know uh, whether it was a placebo or the active ingredient, you will just grade it without uh, being affected. So this is the gist of how different levels of uh, not knowing what's going on uh, affect a trial. So, but these are, the, the blinding is to basically establish whether the treatment works or it doesn't work. Basically, it's, it's like answering whether we should be following up on this agent or not. And, and if the answer is that yes, it, it's definitely worth to follow up. And then we are going to the next phases of clinical trials. And, and, the, and usually in the earlier phases, that's when you see the double blind testing, 
and in the later phases it's open label test so basically the patients know what they are getting and the era of uh, drug versus placebo is long long gone and now the clinical trials are much more complex much more sophisticated and basically you are not getting all or nothing but you are getting uh, different therapies and comparing uh, one therapy to another which one works better so we want to give the patients their best chance and if there's a, a new drug, then we are comparing the current best therapy, best drug, to the new experimental drug. And if the new experimental drug is better than the current best, then we are giving it a chance. And, uh, and how you can give it a chance? To test it with a large number of population, to be representative uh, of how it will work if, if, you, if you have that um, medication available planet-wide. And that's why we have to test it in a larger group of people, because maybe you are testing it in a small village, and in that small village there's only very little racial uh, difference, uh, very little genetic difference, and, you, and that might be significantly skewing the outcome of the test. And that's why we need uh, to involve a lot of people. Nowadays, the um, drug testings are done at least in a nationwide setting, and sometimes there are multi countries involved. There are drugs that are being tested in 50 to 100 countries. So uh, we are talking about uh, tens of millions of people being involved in clinical trials worldwide at, at any day. And, uh, and basically, that's the amount of um, attention that you would need and, and the data set that you need to collect to have uh, uh, a valid information about the how well that agent is performing, what are the side effects and how safe it is on the long term. So how can we interpolate this to audio? So one of the problems is that uh, in medicine, with drugs and treatments, there is a measurable outcome. And then we do statistical analysis on the measurable outcome. And there is a significance that will tell us how, what is the confidence level of our test, how much we can trust the result of the test. And that's called the p-value, the dreaded p-value. And, and if the p-value is really, really small, then, then uh, you know that the test works really well. If the p-value is very high, then uh, it, it needs working on it. And in audio, we have uh, something completely different. Because there, when we do a double-blind test, then it's, we cannot measure the phenomena that we are testing. That's why we are involving the people to tell us what is happening. And I think now everyone sees what is the big issue here, is that what is being tested in audio double-blind test is not the audio gear. We are testing the judges, we are testing the people who are listening to the audio gear can they hear the difference between uh, gear or they cannot? And, uh, and basically the result of the test is not whether A is better than B or, or you hear more, can reproduce more lower level details than the other equipment or has better tonality or not, but the, the person who is listening, who is being tested, how can they perform? Do they pass the test or not? And, uh, and, uh, and this is the key thing about audio tests, is that you always, always have to look at the panel of judges, those panel of people who are being auditioned with that double-blind test, because it's not just auditioning the gear, it's auditioning the people who are doing the testing. And... Uh, and that's the absolute vital information you need to know about any audio blind test is the uh, qualification, the ability 
uh, of the testers of those people who did the blind testing because uh, you see you have three different people let's say you have a, a, a sheet metal worker who, who works all day in, a, in an extremely loud environment with super damaged hearing you have an accountant and you have a, a conductor a panel of these three At, and then you try to ascertain uh, whether equipment A or B has better low-level detail or, or has better tone or higher resolution, better imaging, etc. And, and of course, now you see that in this panel, there's only one person who has the qualification to, uh, do, to conduct that test. The other two are, uh, one of them is perfectly unsuitable to be a judge for a double blind test, and the other one, the accountant, we don't know if he ever listened to music or, or, or if he knows how an instrument, how a violin sounds in real life. His, his hearing is most likely just skewed by listening to his television, to his mobile phone, and that's what he, that is his baseline, that are his standards. He has no clue what to listen for. There's only the conductor who has both the, the, the training, the music training, who intimately knows how instruments sound, how a proper room acoustic sounds, and, and what we truly need for audio testing is to have people who are experts, like conductors, to share their opinion is on what they hear of, uh, from the equipment being tested. And, uh, and this is something that we have been always doing. Uh, my mentor has organized uh, the audio club meetings and, and a lot of, lot of listening tests where all of us audiophiles, uh, we got together and we listened to things. We listened to equipment comparisons and uh, almost every time we knew what was being compared uh, and then we listened to it and then we shared our experiences. Uh, and then everyone shared, some people said, mm, I can't hear any difference between the two. Others said, I can hear a difference. Yeah, it's clear, it's night and day, but I don't know which is better. I like both, I don't care. And there were some people who just re literally shred them apart and, and went down to the minutest detail describing what was going on. And, uh, and when we had... Uh, the double blind test, we also had some double blind tests, so Stu organized a couple of double blind tests as well, and, and there he removed our bias, so he kept us blind. So for example, the, the power cord blind testing, it was in such a way that he put all of the power cords behind the equipment track, and we couldn't even see the power cords, and he went behind the rack, he just said, we are testing number one. And he plugged in something and he left the room right away. And he didn't even turn towards us. We didn't see his face, nothing. No reactions, nothing. Listen to a song. And then he came in, they did something. We are listening to number two. He left again. And, and we did that until he hit number 12. And then we wrote down we were forbidden to discuss what we heard with each other. We were just sitting, could write down our uh, impressions. And after the whole thing, then we discussed what happened, who heard what. And, and it was very interesting to hear because there were people who, who said that, yeah, I can hear something's going on. There were these and these and these, uh, which sounded very very similar couldn't tell anything and there were these which sounded very different but how is it better or not i don't know it was very different but there was this one that, that i think it, it i like that much better than the rest so this was the lower end of the spectrum and at the higher end of the spectrum there were three cables that uh, basically all of us who could give a detailed account uh, had a perception to distinguish finer details, had the training and experience, every single one of us came with, up with the same top three choices. And, and all of us, we also caught that uh, twice Stu put back a cord that was already tested before. So, 
So, and that's something that he did not tell. He did not prepare anyone that he is going to put back one chord twice. And, uh, and, and this is like kind of um, a good way for an audio uh, double blind testing that's feasible. Of course, it could have been uh, done even more elaborately to make it truly, truly blind. But uh, this is basically the max that you can do when you are an audiophile as a, a music lover. That's uh, the maximum. If you are uh, just an individual like myself, I don't own an audio store. So for me, the options to organize a double blind testing would be much more limited. I could involve Nelly, maybe uh, bring over a few other audio buddies. But, uh, but that's it, just a few people. And, and that would not tell you anything because you never met me. You don't know how my hearing works, how those other people's hearings work. It will be a completely worthless piece of information for you. What was the outcome of the double blind test? So why do I endorse to do tests and double blind tests? It's because I, I really recommend to do it when you participate in it. And I would say everyone owes to himself or herself to participate in at least one properly planned and executed audio double blind test. And that is because you will uh, experience not just how the process goes, uh, but you will also experience uh, how, what is your personal bias. Because when you do a double blind test, and, and what you hear and what you experience is not different compared to what you experienced uh, when, when the testing is not double blind, then you know that you can trust your own judgment, that you can stay objective. You can believe what you say and you, your hearing and, and your judgment is to that level that you can trust and build on it. And when you notice that when you heard something that that and, and then you listen to those exact same products knowing what they are and then the experience is very different then that's an indication a feedback for you that you have a very long road to travel to work a lot on your hearing ability and your hearing skills and that's what I emphasize in my channel that the biggest part of the audio journey is working on yourself because uh, the most the majority of your system is you on how you perceive the music it's all about you and not about your audio gear i, I think uh, that's that's what i really wanted to say that the double blind tests are a very powerful tool to learn your own bias and, and when someone reports a double blind testing, you, you don't know. This is not included in the test. What was the person's personal bias? So that's why you have to participate to see how it works on you and, and look at other people and look at their reactions because everyone will have different reactions and you learn that everyone has different personal biases. There are some people who are like razor beasts and uh, they give you the exact same rating, double blind tested or open testing. And there are some who, when you double blind them, will give you a complete sham compared to an open testing. So when you read a double blind test, if there is no control on the judges, uh, then it's completely worthless. And what is, would be a control on the judges? To repeat the exact same test, uh, before the double blind testing with the people knowing the gear and if they say the same thing when they know what they hear compared to when they don't know what they hear then their judgment can be trusted if not they have a very strong bias so first when you do double blind test you have to establish <laughs> how much uh, a person's personal bias is to give uh, credit, to give power of the outcome. So thank you for tuning in. I hope that was a little bit helpful. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye.